Yay! <laughs> Shall we begin? We are live, Joshua. We are. Okay. So let's, um, good afternoon and welcome to the Balticon panel on There Is No Finish Line, Momentum for Writers. Um, my name is Joshua Billmus. I'm the head of Jabberwocky Literary Agency, and I've worked with uh, Lots of great science fiction and fantasy writers, including Brandon Sanderson, Shlaine Harris, Elizabeth Moon. Um, this weekend, I'm kind of telling people about Nick Martell's The Kingdom of Liars, which is a debut fantasy that I am very excited about. Um, and I will um, let the other panelists introduce themselves, beginning with D.H. Ayer. Hi, I'm D.H. Ayer. I'm a sci-fi and fantasy writer. Um, I have 19 uh, books in print. My latest is Nowhere to Go But Mars. It's a novella. Um, and I'm, I live this panel. Okay. And Scott Edelman. Hi, everybody. I am Scott Edelman. I am approaching the 50th anniversary of my first convention ever, which was the 4th of July weekend in 1970, a comic book convention in New York. I have to apologize for not giving you these jelly beans. <laughs> I bought four pounds of jelly beans to hand out at Balticon, <laughs> and unfortunately, it's not a physical one, so you'll have to get it next year. My 100th short story will be published uh, in an anthology called Prison from PS Publishing. My most recent short story collection is Tell Me Like You've Done Before from Leith Press. And I am also, in addition to also writing comic books, that's where my career began in Marvel Comics. I host the Eating the Fantastic podcast in which I take guests out for lunch or dinner, feed them and throw questions at them. And one of those guests will be introducing himself Shortly, Keith R.A. DeCandido was one of those guests. And you can, if you don't get enough of him today, go find that episode. That's who I am. And, you know, I wasn't sure if Scott would have food, so I stocked <laughs> up as well. And I have some uh, pumpkin chip, chocolate chip loaf, and banana chocolate chip loaf, and a cookie. But I'm glad that Scott didn't let me down and I can save all my food for myself. And as a quintessential New Yorker, Joshua, I would have expected a black and white cookie, not a chocolate chip cookie, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hungry. I will take anything. <laughs> well, Isn't this what everyone came to hear us talk about? <laughs> <laughs> um, Keith? Hi, I'm Keith Murray DeCandido. Uh, I have written a ridiculous number of books or a number of ridiculous books, depending on which Amazon reviews you read. Um, over 50 novels, around 100 short stories, a lot of comic books, and more nonfiction than I'm really uh, able to count. Um, I've written in about 30 different licensed universes from Alien to Zorro, uh, and also including things like Supernatural, Star Trek, uh, Orphan Black, uh, and any number of others, um, World of Warcraft. And I've also written a lot of original stuff, including my fantasy police procedural series, uh, the latest of which is Mermaid Precinct from Eastpec Books. Uh, an urban fantasy series taking place in the Bronx involving a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx who hunts monsters for a living, which is published by Wordfire Press, The Furnace Seal. Autobiographical, right, uh, Keith? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, a bunch of other things. I've got two novels coming out uh, for sure this year, collaborations with David Sherman called To Hell and Regroup, and with Dr. Munish K. Batra, a thriller called Animal. Um, and uh, I also write about pop culture for Tor.com. And I've got short stories coming out this year in Badass Moms and Pangea 3, and probably some other stuff too that I can't recall due to a distinct lack of sleep. <laughs> and El Marie? <laughs> I'll be laughing a lot on this panel, I can tell you that much. <laughs> I'm a psychological horror author. Uh, I've won the uh, Golden Stake Award in 2019 for my novel, The Promise Keeper. Um, my most recent short story is part of the uh, Bram Stoker finalist collection called Sycorax's Daughters. 
I have a few things coming out this year. My fourth novel uh, called The Realm should be coming out at the end of summer. However, you know, it was supposed to be out now. So we'll see with the delay, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, we'll see. A um, couple of short stories coming out as well. Some things I haven't written before actually. So I'm kind of excited to explore YA fiction, which was brand new to me. So yeah, lots of fun mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so one housekeeping thing, well, I'll keep an eye on both the chat and the Q&A. If you want to ask a question, put it in the Q&A section for all of the attendees. Um, somebody was saying, I can't get jelly beans. I mean, that four pound thing comes from Costco. So if you have a Costco near you, you can probably get some jelly beans for yourself. Um, so, um, okay, why don't we start? Um, DH, you said you live this panel. So why don't you tell us what you mean uh, about that? Let's hear the story. I've been writing, I was a closet writer for decades, right? Um, I started writing in my teens some really bad stuff and started getting better when I started getting rejections. And once I got rejections in my 20s, they were so painful, I stopped writing. And, well, I stopped sending in. I didn't stop writing. I couldn't not write. I was always writing. When I got married, my wife said, oh, your writing thing is now over. You have a life to lead. So I got published around the time I got divorced. And I kept uh, writing. And about a year after I got divorced, I got my first book contract. And um, I, it's, it's a never ending process. Every time I write something, I rewrite it and rewrite it and submit it and get rejected and rewrite it. And then I'm working on the next project and there's never a finish line. And I can send something to my editor and she'll say, guess what? It's not done. And then I go, oh, but I'm ready to work on the next project. And it, it, it's always going until I finally publish something and then move on to the next project. But I've always got something else going. And like I sent off a novel to my editor yesterday. I lined up two beta readers here at Balticon online. I, I, and I'm keep going because those are for new projects I need input on because my editor may not be right or my editor may be totally right. But without some more beta readers, I'll never know. And it just goes on and on. And I, before this panel, I started writing a list of what am I supposed to work on next after I finish blogging about Balticon and this panel. So, and then, um, you know, if we look at it from kind of the overall career standpoint, um, there's the part of momentum where things are going really well and then there's the part of momentum where things have come to a stop and you're wondering what to do to get things started again. Um, so, um, you know, Keith, why don't you tell us a little about like one time in your career when it was just like everything seemed to be going incredibly and like how that happened and maybe talk a little bit about a time where you were like, I don't know what's going to happen and finding the next thing after that. Um, the, a lot of the times when it's happened in both directions, it's been due to circumstances completely out of my control. Um, you know, I, I suddenly get, you know, three editors calling me up saying, hey, we want you to write a novel. And I, because when editors call you saying they want you to write a novel, you usually say yes. Um, and then trying to figure out how to make that work. And then, you know, a whole year goes by and I don't hear from anybody. Um, and so I work on other stuff. Um, part of the trick is to, I mean, one of, I, I mentioned that I do, you know, I've written novels, short stories, comic books, nonfiction. Uh, I also do freelance editorial work. Um, I'm also a martial artist and I teach karate to kids. I'm not doing it right now, but uh, uh, hopefully once the pandemic passes, I'll be back to that. And, um, I do a lot of different things. Uh, I've done nonfiction writing for websites uh, and, and stuff. So part of the way I keep the momentum going is having many different things going on at once. Um, 
I'm not necessarily working on many things at once, but I've got different projects at different stages. Part of that is because I'm a freelancer, so I don't have a day job to fall back on. So I've got to have a lot of balls in the air. Otherwise, you know, if I stop working, they stop paying me. Um, but, but it also helps, you know, when there's, when the novels are not going as well, I've got short stories to work on. If the short stories aren't going well, I've got editorial projects to work on. Um, I have, I write twice weekly for tour.com. So that's always there. Um, when there's not a pandemic, I'm teaching three days a week. So I've got that. And there's always something happening. Um, and part of that also helps if you find yourself stuck on something. If, if fiction writer brain has decided to, to go, go take a nap, then editor brain can work for a little bit, a little while. Or, you know, martial arts brain can work for a little while, or nonfiction brain can work for a little while, you know. Or, or sometimes I just got to go, like, you know, binge watch something on Netflix for a few hours and get my brain back in gear, you know. Um, so those are, those are some of the ways I do that, is just to try to have... And, it, and it's usually this is similar to what DH was saying. You know, you, you're not only doing one thing at a time. And, you know, if you're writing, you're usually, you've got one novel you've finished, you've got one novel you're working on, you've got what, the next novel you're thinking about the plot for. There's always stuff. And you just got to, you know, keep, keep the uh, pedals turning, as it were. And now, Scott, you're like uh, Keith in that you've had a career with an awful lot of different components to it. So is that like your experience as well? Um, has it been different for you over the years? Well, one of the difficulties is you're talking about momentum and dealing with momentum and choosing how you're going to deal with your life. When I worked at Marvel Comics back in the 70s, I got as much freelance as I could possibly want, not necessarily writing comics, but writing letter columns, writing uh, splash pages for British reprint books, writing ads, you know, editing Foom magazine. Uh, I was making more money as a freelancer than I was from my staff job, and it became difficult to write short stories. When I got that job, I was writing my short stories, very much wanting to you know, go to Clarion and uh, you know, focus on that. And I, during that period, when I had the success, I discovered uh, I wasn't getting any fiction written. So you're saying, well, was that good or bad? Well, it was good for getting comics written. Uh, it was bad for, uh, gee, I haven't written any short stories in a while because if someone said we'll give you as much work as you can want if you hand it in by Wednesday you'll get paid Friday uh, that's how it was back then John reported would work around and hand you the check uh, so I had that you know that issue but my my feeling about keeping up the momentum it really means two things when you ask the question about momentum there's the momentum gee I can't write type of momentum how do I keep writing and there's the I'm not selling anything you know, how do I keep my spirits up when everybody is telling me they don't want uh, the story? So they, you can really split it into two different things. And there was uh, you know, a point, you know, I submitted my first story when I was 16 years old to FNSF. I mailed it off. The envelope came back three days later. And I said, oh, I must have accidentally put the, from the old days, pre-email, I must have accidentally put the stamp self-addressed envelope on the outside. <laughs> no one could possibly reject a story in real time in the mail in three days and have it go from Brooklyn to Connecticut and Brooklyn. I think it was Stanford back then. But no, they rejected my story in three days. They opened the envelope, looked at it, put it back. Uh, there comes a point in one's career when you realize that at the beginning, it's, yeah, that deserves to be rejected. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, you know, wandering around trying to do this thing. And then there comes a point when you say, this is a good story. And if they don't want the story, it's just not the story that they want. Uh, you know, like if you bake a blueberry pie and someone tells you, you know, this pie would be a lot better if you scraped all the blueberry out and put apple inside and made it into a cake instead. That's not useful information. If someone says, well, if you rolled out the dough in a different way, the crust on your blueberry pie, that I can deal with. But there's a point in which you just go forward because you will find eventually, you have to have the belief that eventually it will click. And one last thing, I will shut up. I submitted a story to Analog in 1972. That was my first rejection, rejected by Ben Bova. I was not accepted by Analog for 44 years. I spent 44 years sending stories, a couple a year, to Analog through Ben Bova, through Stan Schmidt, through Trevor Quatri, and, and then in 2016, I sold two stories to Trevor. 
And so my final bottom line on all of it is never give up, never surrender. That if you enjoy what you're doing, if you get joy from it, if you get as much fun writing as you would from reading other things, that is sort of its own reward and saying, well, I'll click someday. You know, Scott, if I ever saw you trying that hard to get a car stuck from an, uh, get a car unstuck from an icy patch in a parking lot, I would tell you to like call a tow truck, but <laughs> 44 years. Uh, <laughs> that's, um, so, um, and then let's pick up on what Scott mentioned. And uh, why don't you tell us a little, um, L. Marie, about your like process for the writer's block part of this, that kind of the idea of momentum of just being able to keep going when you can't. That's a, that's actually a really good segue because um, I was thinking that momentum is relative, but I think we've, that's been touched upon quite a bit here, but to speak about writer's block, um, it's a little bit of a different animal. So, and I may, I, I might have a unique perspective here being the only woman on the panel. So I will utilize that to my advantage right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've been writing for a long time, too. Um, for years and years out of college, I decided that I was actually going to try and do this. And so the end of the, oh, just towards the end of the 1990s, I started trying to write and submitting things out. Got a little bit of traction. It was great. However, I had also started a career that I didn't like. Mind you, I'm still in that career. Just bear in mind that I'm still doing that. But whatever, pays the bills. Um, but started doing something and you, you have to climb the corporate ladder and all of that. And I just got married and decided I wanted to have children, start a family. So I put it off as long as I could because I really was getting some good traction with my writing, but I write psychological horror. So when I had my first child, you know, the beasts that were waiting for me to write were literally waiting, standing next to me while I'm looking at my child in the crib. And I just happened to catch a glimpse and I'm like, wait a minute, okay. <laughs> that's a bit much, you know? So it became yeah. difficult for me to write the things that I like to write, the things I like to read, the things I like to watch because I had taken on this new role in my life. And I had writer's block for, I mean, I've got two children and they're, my oldest is 13 coming up in a couple of weeks. So I've had, I had writer's block for about nine and a half, 10 years. But did that mean I didn't write? No, it just meant I didn't write what I love. I didn't write psychological horror. I wrote a little mystery. Then I said, ah, I'm still making that dark and then I can't go as dark as I want. It was like weird. I would hit my head on the wall because I knew what I wanted, but couldn't do it. And so then I started, if you can believe it, writing like articles about gardening, which I don't, I don't have a green thumb, but writing articles about people who don't have green thumbs and trying to learn how to do this gardening thing. And I was writing it for a local newspaper because as ZH mentioned, I had to write. There's nothing in me that says you can stop writing. I, I just had to do it. So writer's block wasn't all encompassing, but I definitely lost momentum on the things I wanted to write down. So every now and then I'd be able to write a note about, hey, don't forget to try and try this character out or don't, maybe he should kill her down the, in, the, in the creek. Just, and that would be the sentence, that's it. And that's it. <laughs> Walk away because I couldn't do anything else with it. But I never, when I, when I broke it, which was such an awesome day, like I literally celebrated down the street that I started being able to write again, to write the stuff I loved. But that day I had all these little snippets left from, that I'd been placing for myself for years. And so I picked them up and started writing them. But in terms of, so, so if there are any moms out there who, who, whose writing has changed because of, you know, becoming the mom and it's such an all-encompassing role that it, you don't all other things kind of get pushed out to the side so just know that you actually can get back to what you were looking to do before what you had done before there's a way back you just have to give it time and let yourself grow but you do still need to try and write and exercise those muscles because if you don't then you can lose it i wrote i went back to school and became a teacher i teach at a community college now wasn't doing that before that's not the job I dislike. I love that. <laughs> I do this other thing that I still don't like. But, you know, I, I, I figured that I needed to immerse myself in the community so that I could be talking about writing, even if I wasn't actually doing it. But the, because it's sort of, it's a need. And I know you know that. I, if you're here on this panel listening to us talk, you're feeling that already. You know it's in, ingrained in you. And it, it, you know you need this. You need the fiction. You need to talk about the fiction you're, you're reading. You need to write, even if it's terrible, doesn't matter. You need to do it. So 
I'm telling you, I'm, as a person who's been through that, I'm gonna come around the other side now. You can get back to it. Just don't press yourself. Don't pressure yourself to get back to it so before you're ready, because then it'll just be garbage. Well, so can I, can I, I, can I add something to that? Yeah. Because the because the, the, there was something I wanted to say on this panel, and Elmarie just provided me with the perfect setup for oh. it. So thank you. Um, the one of the most common things I hear from aspiring writers is that they're having trouble finishing it, or they're worried that 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 you know what they're writing is just terrible. And the the there's no secret handshake. There's no magic trick. There's no anything like that. But the closest I've come to one of those is you have to remind yourself that the first draft is allowed to suck. Mm -hmm. You have to put one foot word in front of the other until you get to the end. And it doesn't matter if they're not the best words. You have to finish what you start. Um, and and, it, and it can be, you, you can find yourself stuck in a position where it's like, I don't know if this is any good. It doesn't matter if it's any good. Get through to the end of it. It is much easier to fix a finished story than it is to fix a fragment. Yep. And your first draft is going to be not as good anyway, because that's what first drafts are. Um, just keep putting the words down. They don't have to be perfect words. A lot of them are going to be the anyway. So just plow through, get to the end. It is so much easier to take a finished product and make it better than it is to keep noodling around with the same three chapters over and over and over and over and over again. Yep. Could Josh? Agree more? Yes. So um, on uh, Elle Marie's comment about how she had a block for uh, nine plus years with the kids. I didn't have it that bad, but a year ago, my father went into the nursing home and he was starting to decline fast. And my day job was getting really, really intense. And then I had to, uh, I found my lease was abruptly being ended because my condo was being sold out from under me. So I was finishing up a major project and when I finished it and my father was declining even more rapidly and business was getting more intense, I didn't go on to the sequel to what I was writing, which was the original plan. I started writing a novella and said, look, I can get something short done that has nothing to do with the brain power I need to do a sequel to the fourth book in my series. I, I'm just, I can't do it. But I really love this story and I've always wanted to make it longer, but I've never written a novella. I've always done either short stories or long form novels, right? So I took on a different project. And when I finished that, I said, I'm still not in the right place. And at that point, my dad was dying. So I started writing a short YA novel that I thought, well, maybe it'll get to 50,000 words. In the final draft, it ended up at 75,000. Hmm. But I finished it and it's done or it's done at the moment until my editor and the beta readers tell me otherwise. But I have to keep writing and I have to keep moving forward. And I don't know when I can get back to book five of the series. I, I may not have that mental ability for another year because we're in a really strange place. And my dad's gone and I'm dreaming about my dad and I can't kind of move on. And I've got two other books that are ready at different points to be published or not, you know, and move on to the next thing because I'm not going to let my momentum stop because once you write and you keep writing, your, your skill level gets better and better and it's easier to write. And even if I have to write some nonfiction piece before moving on to the next, that keeps me going. So, and, and you know, I think um, it, it's, uh, when you talk about that, I mean, back in March, I couldn't read. I mean, it's a big part of my job, but I couldn't do work reading for most of the month of March. There was just too much else floating around in the brain space to be able to do all of that. Um, uh, it's, yeah. Um, and that, um, so maybe this is a little bit of a digression, but I, I think it's a good time maybe to, to ask, um, when you're writing your own work, 
um, you've got a little bit of flexibility on when you write it. And I've like never come across a publisher that hasn't extended a due date when an author is, you know, having to deal with life. But um, like Keith, you've done a lot of projects in, uh, you know, for, 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 for various licensed properties. Have you ever come across a situation where there's just been a deadline that isn't moving at a time when you're not moving? It's, it's happened on both ends, I, both for me as an editor working with a writer where that happened um, and uh, and for myself as a writer, there was there was um, one novel that I was in the midst of writing when I went through a particularly brutal breakup, um, and uh, it just it completely slowed me down. And the work I turned in was not necessarily my best work. Um, luckily, I was I was able to have a chance to at a to revise it uh, afterward. But um, but yeah, and I, I couldn't not work on it because the book was scheduled. You know, uh, tie-in licensed fiction tie-in novels are usually scheduled before you start writing them, um, particularly if it's a smaller license. Um, there was one situation when I was working for Byron Price editing the Marvel novels where somebody had a death in the family. I was able, in that case, to rearrange the schedule um, and basically swap out um, a different book with somebody who had actually turned their book in early, <laughs> which then suddenly had to be rammed into production. Um, so sometimes you're lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot harder. Your, your tie in fiction is very much like, like journalism in some ways you're on a deadline and that deadline is not, is often not mutable. Um, especially if it's a tie into a particular uh, project that is where, where you're, the other parts of it are also time sensitive. So yeah, that can be incredibly difficult. And sometimes it can produce good work. Sometimes under pressure, you find yourself, you know, just, you're not, you, you, because you're so mentally messed up, you just don't think about it and just plow through. Um, I've had situations where, you know, everything was like, oh crap, I forgot about this thing. I got to write this story. Ah! And then I sit down and just, the thing jumps out and writes itself down um, unexpectedly. So you know, it, it's, yes. but it, it can happen and it, and it, yeah, you know, it's a lot easier with your own stuff where they can juggle the schedule a little more easily. And um, so Scott, um, you've actually, I mean, all of the writers on the panel kind of have jobs in a way. They have publishers they're writing books for, um, but, but, but you've been like on stack at a lot of places. Um, you mentioned Marvel Comics. Um, you were working on uh, like a, you know, website, a magazine, a, 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 a science fiction age, a yarn staff. Um, so could you talk a little about the experience at, at some point when like one of those jobs has ended? and you're looking for the next one and like what that, uh, you know, kind of mental navigation has been like? Hmm, one of the day jobs and I have generally not had trouble moving from one job to another, meaning I went from science fiction age and, and where I edited that from 1992 to 2000 uh, and then worked at the Sci-Fi Channel from 2000 to the end of the 2013 uh, but I was always, the reason I had those jobs is I wanted the fiction that I wrote to be mine. Uh, I, I did not want to, well, that's one of the things I learned in comic books is that I didn't want to write comic books, that I wanted to write things that I'm a lousy collaborator. I want it to be my story, not your story. I don't know what the story's about until I finish the end of the second draft. Uh, and in fact, I recently gave up a job because I discovered that it was interfering with my writing. I was writing a weekly newsletter for uh, the Shutter Channel, which is owned by AMC. And I spent uh, about a year and a half, I think, doing a weekly newsletter and discovered I was getting no writing done because I was waking up in the middle of the night thinking of a good headline for the next newsletter rather than the next line in, in a story. So I was always very much 
protecting, I had day jobs in order to protect the writing so I could write what I wanted, not what anyone uh, else wanted uh, to write. So I don't know that that's necessarily an answer to the question because the jobs I had would only affect my writing in terms of if they were too all encompassing, they would get in the way sometimes of allowing me the psychic space. I, I want to piggyback on something that, you know, that Keith said, that piggybacked on something that Elmarie said about giving yourself permission to suck. Because I think here's something that stops a lot of people from moving forward is also give yourself permission not to be godlike. Because often when people sit down and write that story, it's not that they are looking for permission to not, you know, to be at the bottom. They're saying, I can't write this. It's supposed to be meaningful. I'm supposed to write a story that changes the world. I'm supposed to write something that's the greatest story I have ever written, better than all the other stories I ever wrote. And I realized long ago, I, I heard someone talking about poets. What's the difference between a major poet and a minor poet? A major poet has, a minor poet has been hidden, hit by lightning once in his or her life. A major poet has been hit by lightning several times in your life. And often the story that you're writing, not that you want to write crap, but you, that, you have to think of it as a career. The individual story and project is not the be all and end all of your life. And often that story you're working on, you want it to be a good story, but you're gonna learn from that story to write the story to come and learn from the next story. The one story you learn more about setting, one story you learn more about pacing your character. It's not that you're trying to write bad stories. It's that you have to give yourself permission to have the story be, okay, that was a good story. That'll entertain some people. And maybe like if I look back at a hundred stories, those are not all equal All of those hundred stories that have been published. And there are a few you look at and say, this one I think is important to me. This one will matter. This one people have told me they cried over or something like that. But I couldn't write that story without writing the 20 I wrote before it that gave me the skills necessary to write that. So I think that, so you've got those two poles, you know, the pole that the, the, the others were talking about, about, okay, I'm going to write it down, even if it's terrible. And you, you're you not writing because it's, you think it's terrible, but also just write the story, even if it's not going to change the world and make people hail you as a people's poet. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from the audience and we don't have a lot. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them into the Q and A, but we have one which, um, uh, I, I, I'd ask uh, first uh, DH and then L and then L Marie to uh, respond to, but um, it's what kind uh, what kind of um, what kind of communities of 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 support do you have online or in real life? And since both of you have been talking about trying to get through some, you know, hard situations. Um, you know, DH, you've spoken about the hardships in your life and El Marie about that nine year period. I think it's really interesting. I mean, what helped you externally to navigate through those? So DH, if you want to go first with that. So um, as I was approaching my, uh, oncoming train of a divorce, I started to wonder, I was unemployed at the same time. It was uh, 2008, 2009, not a great time to be working in a nonprofit. And uh, I was wondering if the stories I'd written were good enough to get published. And um, I looked at Scribd and I thought, no, that's not a place anyone's gonna find me if I post. And then I learned about writing.com. So I posted a story and there was a, a contest that if you uh, were one of the first two people to win first and second prize, you'd end up in there easy. I won first place. Now their readership was probably about 30 people, but still uh, an editor who had an ongoing e -zine for about five years thought that my, my story was worth it. And I entered a couple more and they kept consistently coming in one and two. And eventually um, one of the things I started to serialize got published by a small press. And you know, it's like, okay, people are like seeing the worth of what I'm writing because I've got a contract. And now some of my short stories are being asked for, for to be in 
an anthology and maybe I'll submit some stories. And now I'm getting published for these short stories. And well, maybe I should work on the next novel and see if the, my first publisher wants to write, see the sequel or not, you know, and on it went. And so writing.com became an interesting home for me. And I still write, share my blog articles with the groups I work with there who are into science fiction and fantasy. But I've also found that there are people here uh, at the con who are very helpful. Um, over the years, I've met them and, you know, I've said, you know, I'm trying to write this story about, you know, that's only got villains. There's no heroes. And someone says, well, if you do that, you should do X, Y, and Z. Oh, and then I would work on stories that way. So I've met people that I can talk to and I've met editors who actually I've hired to do editing for me that have been very helpful too. But I don't have enough beta readers in life. I don't have enough uh, support in life for what I do, but that's not gonna stop me from continuing to move forward. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they'll come, maybe they won't. I've had some people who are big fans and became beta readers and really were very helpful. And sometimes you meet them and sometimes they pass away in the night and do their own things. But yeah. that's my network. Okay. And Elmarie, your, yours? Yeah, so, I mean, the whole convention world is new to me because, you know, that nine-year nine block is huge, right? I mean, I did a convention before the nine-year block, and then I've done two or three years of it since, you know, like this. So I've been to maybe five, six, maybe. Um, so that's not, while it's my tribe in terms of people who think like me and, you know, do the same stuff I do, that's not the group from which I was able to gather, like, support during the, the nine-year drought. Let's call it that. I don't know. Maybe for now we'll call it that. So... <laughs> I mentioned that I went back to school to, and I ended up, I'm a professor at a, a community college now, which was not anything that was on the radar at first, but what, what happened is I, you know, had, had my son, stopped writing, started, then said, no, you can't just not write, started writing, you know, the articles as I mentioned before, started writing a mystery novel. So now we had all these little, again, balls in the air, none of the balls I really wanted, but still balls in the air. And I said, you know, I, one of my friends was reading the article because I wrote for the local newspaper. So, and I didn't use my pen name. So everyone just, it was just me and I lived around the street. So, you know what I mean? Just go to the, you go to the cleaners and someone's like, hey, I read your article. That'd be, it's, it's, it's cool though, to be honest. That's kind of neat, but still. So I got a couple of, hey, I read your, your article. Hey, that one read like a story. And I'm like, yeah, it might've, <laughs> you know, because I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to make myself do this. And then someone says, hey, I really enjoyed that. Were you trying, were you starting a story and did you decide to write it? And I'm like, no, I did Well, maybe I should look at this again, you know? <laughs> and so I kept getting these little, every now and then randomly, someone would say that they read something they enjoyed because it was story-like, if you will. And then when I uh, started to, to apply to teach at the school, then, that is also around the corner. I don't go very far. Um, you know, I submitted some fiction to, to show them, listen, I can teach, of course I can teach composition, but if we get to the point where we have a lot of students who are doing creative writing, well, I mean, I used to do this and I used to do that and here's a submission, it's part of my mystery novel. And I mean, the, the response was awesome. You know, it yeah. was very, they were very excited about the work, even though I wasn't quite as excited about it. I didn't feel it yet, you know? And so over the years, I've gotten just these random, just, comments that come to me. And that has built my confidence that at the time had built my confidence up to say, listen, you haven't lost it. It's just sleeping. It keeps coming up every now and then, but it's, it's, it's still there. And I think that that comes with, I mean, there's just two things. If you never show your work, then no one's ever going to be able to tell you those things. Right. So you've got to figure out a way to put your work out there in whatever way that is. I mean, I was lucky. My husband doesn't read anything like nothing, not the newspaper, not a magazine, nothing at all. I don't know how he and I are together for 20 something years. <laughs> but he reads my work and he's, re he's a really good editor. Gosh, it's kind of annoying. He's a really good editor. <laughs> and so I give him my work. And even when I was having the nine year drought, I gave him these things and said, check it out. And he would come back and say, why, what's wrong? I mean, this is so good. Just keep this for your story. If you write a different article, keep that part for another story. So, just, I think that the not, not keeping it to myself really helped me because if I had never heard these little comments here and there from random people, um, I would never know that I, it wasn't gone. Cause that yeah. was my fear that it was gone. Psychological horror was completely gone. 
and it, it really wasn't, so. And um, Keith, um, seems to me one of the things to help keep momentum in a long career is knowing people. Um, so, why don't you talk a little bit about just like your start in the business and then how you kind of came across some, like not all, but some of the other people that have helped sustain you for writing, you know, literally dozens of novels. It's knowing people is helpful for if for no other reason than to give you the opportunity to pitch you still have to actually you know write stuff that doesn't suck um which which certainly helps um i've been i've been it's funny i've actually been doing a series on i have a channel on youtube called crad covid readings which is i've been reading my works of short fiction uh you can find it on youtube um i've been posting all over it on my social media but i just for this coming week read a story that I wrote in 1995. It was only my third published story. And I was really worried because I hadn't looked at it in ages. And I was worried that it was going to be terrible. And I actually wasn't. I was stunned. But um, it's that opportunity came about because of people I had met at a convention. I had met the, it was a Magic the Gathering story. And I had met the people from Wizards of the Coast uh, when Magic was just getting started in 93. And I stayed in touch with them. Um, several of the opportunities I got to pitch stories were anthologies that were being edited by people who had written short stories for anthologies that I was editing as part of my job working for Byron Price. Um, I put together, I was an editor for Byron for five years and um, editing science fiction and fantasy, including a bunch of anthologies. So I got to work with a lot of different authors and some of those were also editors who were doing other projects. So. Um, and, and, and who also like knew of other projects and we would talk to each other. So networking is certainly a part of it uh, and can be very helpful. Um, and certainly the five years I spent in the trenches as a baby editor working for a book packager uh, exposed me to a lot of opportunities that I then took advantage of. You still have to take advantage of them and you still have to write good stories and hit your deadlines and do all that other fun stuff. But, um, but it certainly helped a lot. Uh, and this was this was in the mid. You know, I started writing fiction in 1994, so it was before there were a lot of really great online resources. We basically had like Genie and CompuServe, <laughs> um, which you know, text scrolling on your monochrome monitor. Very. You slow. had um, what? Yeah, <laughs> um, but that that was uh, that was pretty much it. There there are still resources that I take advantage of now. Um, networking opportunities on that come online. Uh, you know, through Facebook groups and through blogs and through Twitter feeds and people who retweet something and say, hey, I, you did this. I would like to talk to you about this other thing, you know. Um, conventions like this, whether they're in real time or, or over Zoom, are all opportunities to meet with people. The, my current, my, the, one of my current publishers is eSpec Books. Also, um, we had a virtual launch party last night. I only know Danny and Mike, the, the husband and wife team who, who run eSpec along with Greg Shower, I met them at a convention because Danny and I were on a panel together at Icon back in 2001 and we stayed in touch and now she's my publisher and, you know, and that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for that particular networking opportunity. So, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's certainly one of these steps um, and one of the things that you can do to help, to help keep your momentum going to keep it on top. And uh, DH, I'll come back to you with a question we have from the audience. Somebody is wondering about, um, let me, um, you know, uh, um, can, uh, they, they want perspective on a keeping, keeping momentum towards a writing career when you also have another full-time career. So how has that worked for you? First, rule number one, never give up your day job, okay? Um, if you sell a short story for $25, <laughs> you, you can't afford to give up your health insurance and say, I'm making it big. I sold that $25 story. And believe me, I sold um, a $25 story and someone wanted to buy it as a reprint and they paid me another 50. So that story was worth 50, 75. 
five dollars to me. Um, but you have to keep your day job to keep your benefits and to be able to live because most people um, aren't going to be able to make a career like Keith has and, and Scott has clearly had day jobs um, and found that balance has been a problem too. He's given up some jobs because he wants to focus on his writing. There's times in your life where you can focus on your writing and there are other times you can't. But keeping up the momentum means, look, I may have to write short stories for a while. I can work on my novel. I can outline. I happen to be a pantser. I discover my story and then keep rewriting it until the story is the way I want to say it. And I find some very interesting things to say. And sometimes my editor says, no, you don't want to go that way. <laughs> Make a change here, which is just fine because I take it in stride because my editor knows better than me usually. <laughs> but, so, uh, well said. And um, so we're down to just a couple minutes. Um, there's something that El Marie has, which I thought we should all get a chance to look at before the end of the panel. Is that clear? And do you want to tell us what this is? Yeah, so earlier on, I mentioned that I won the Golden Stake Award for my novel, The Promise Keeper. It's Let's literally, into an actual Golden Stake. It's an actual Golden Stake. That is awesome. Please note the blood. Yes. The blood <laughs> is fantastic. <laughs> and whose blood is that, Elmarie? <laughs> I warned you. I told you I was a psychological horror author. I told you. So look at this. I just love this thing so much. An actual <laughs> stake. And it's golden, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so, um, I'll just go around for any quick final thoughts. Um, I'll hang out in the, uh, in the literary writing after panel chat for a few minutes. I'll go there after the end of the panel. Are there any just quick, very short final notes? We're getting on, uh, 50 past. Anyone? I'll be there as well to answer Andy's question about community versus, uh, you know, struggling to get work because this is a community and you don't want to be a shark. You want to, these are your friends and it'll eventually lead to things. And I'll talk more about that on Discord if anyone is going over there in the final seconds we've got here. I will not be on Discord. I just want to say, just keep, put your butt in the chair, put your fingers on the keyboard and keep putting one word in front of the other until you're done. And then go back okay. and fix it later. Yeah. <laughs> You can find me on Discord. My website is dhair.net. Thank you for being here. Thank you I just you put all. my URL in the chat, elmariewood.com. Come check me out. We'll keep laughing. So Probably. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I think it's been a great 50 minutes, and I appreciate the chance to talk with all of you. Thanks. <laughs> and next year in Meet Space. Yeah. That went so fast. Thank you, Josh. You're welcome. <laughs>